welcome all to lecture 6. So, again like uh, last two classes we were discussing about different uh, uh, geotechnical investigation methods. Today also we will be discussing some more geotechnical investigation methods. So, before we move to any other method, let us discuss about what whatever we had discussed in next class. Yeah. So, we were discussing about uh, yesterday we actually we, we, we had uh, discussed about Wayne shear test. So, uh, we talked about what, what uh, how we do the test, what is the test procedure, what is the setup required and then we move to what are the advantages of uh, Wayne shear test particularly when, when you are talking about uh, uh, very soft clays in uh, fully saturated condition where the, you find it difficult to collect uh, undisturbed soil sample, you can actually uh, uh, determine the shear strength property there itself in its natural condition just by lowering the vein and then measuring the torque in its natural condition and of course, depending upon your rate of rotation, uh, you can uh, later on call it as uh, remodeled sample and that is how you can also determine the sensitivity of the material. Then limitations also, we discussed like in case of fissured uh, material, we cannot use it. Secondly, we cannot use it if the shear strength in horizontal as well as in vertical directions are significantly different from each other. So, we will discuss certain advantages as well as disadvantages or limitations of vein shear test. Then we solved some numerical problem in order to understand like once you know the torque, field measure torque, once you know the uh, dimension of the vein to be used and depending upon the depth from which you are uh, uh, determining, you will be able to determine the shear strength property, undrained shear strength properties. So, we solved some numerical. Then we also talk about another method which is called a standard penetration test, more or less now it is being standardized uh, method about, about the sample size upon number of blows, interpretation and all that. So, we had discussed about um, uh, standard penetration test yesterday. Today we will be discussing some more uh, uh, details about standard penetration test or probably what, what output we can get. So, we were discussing like based on field investigation you get your NSPT value that is field recorded SPTN value or NF and then depending upon the depth at which you are conducting the test, you, once you get the value of sigma V prime that is uh, um, effective overburden pressure, NF value and CU values, you, you can also determine the relative density of the material at the site of the interest. Then same way if you know the corrected NSPT that is for overburden correction as well as for dilatancy correction, you can actually determine how much will be the angle of internal friction and say same uh, as per given by Schmerdmann in 1975. You can also determine you have to have the value of atmospheric pressure and you have to have the value of overburden pressure at the, at the depth of the interest and then correct it in SPT for overburden correction, you will be able to determine how much uh, and this is like field recorded as an SPT value, recorded an SPT. So, first one requires corrected in an SPT based for uh, overburden correction as well as dilatancy correction. Second one, once you have uh, field recorded in an SPT, you can actually directly use it for determination of angle of internal friction. Okay, so, today we will be uh, we will be solving some problem related to the yesterday discussion on standard penetration test. So, the problem is like during field investigation, an SPT was measured as 40 in a sand layer which is available at 6 meter depth and another um, at 7.5 meter it was measured as 32. If the saturated unit weight of the sand is 19 kilo Newton per meter cube, so you know uh, once you collected the sample you test it in the, uh, in the laboratory you will be able to understand what will be the saturated unit weight considering the ground water table is at the ground surface because no specific information is gov uh, available in this numerical for problem about the depth of water table. So, we will con assume the ground water table is at the surface. So, you have to determine what should be the corrected N SPT. So, you went to the side actually, you, uh, you set up your uh, 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 SPT, uh, this uh, monkey hammer, then drilling arrangement, then uh, dropping arrangement, then your sampler you lowered at uh, uh, 6 meter depth once you uh, reached, you started measuring how many number of blows for 15, 15 and 15 centimeter penetration and then last two um, uh, uh, penetration of 150 mm each, how much is the number of blows? total number of blows like N2 plus N3. So, this is like your N2 and N3 values. So, this is your N2 plus N3 values. N1 value we, will, we generally do not consider as I told yesterday because it might be containing lot of uh, disturbances from the surrounding activities as well as it may contain lot of uh, vegetations. 
So, we will not go for n1 values, we will consider only n2 and n3 n values. Similarly, same test. So, after 6 meter, you remove your sampler, you start again going for go for boring or drilling depending upon what kind of medium is available between 6 meter and 7.5 meter. You reach 7.5 meter, then you again start, uh, you replace uh, your uh, boring arrangement with your SPT sampler and then start again counting number of blows just like this for second and third 150 mm penetration and it was found like 32 is the NSPT value. So, it is told like considering the soil is saturated sand having unit weight of 19 kilo Newton per meter cube which you can get from uh, 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 collected sample tested in the lab, you have to determine what is the corrected NSPT value. So, corrected means you have to apply correction whatever we had discussed earlier. So, let us uh, solve this example, but before going into detail, let us see what, what things are given here. So, we have we, we know like things which are given here are number 1 is we should write here very clearly what is given here. So, N value at 6 meter depth is given as 40 gamma saturated is given as 19 kilo Newton per meter cube. Okay. So, based on this uh, saturated unit weight what you can determine actually first of all you have to determine C N value that is overburden correction overburden correction factor. So, for this we are actually using the, um, the correlation given by Peck et al 1974. So, if a specific correlation is suppose is asked to, to uh, be used in the numerical problem it, it is generally mentioned. Okay, this is also given by this is also recommended by IS. 2131 1981. So, IS 2131 also recommends you can use this correlation factor which is given as CN equals to 0 0.77 log 2000 over sigma V prime that is overburden pressure. So, in order to use this first of all determine how much be the value of sigma V prime at 6 meter depth. So, it will be corresponding to 19 is the saturated unit weight minus 9.81 is the unit weight of water then multiply by 6 so that will give you how much will be the value of effective uh, overburden pressure. So, that, that comes out to be 55.14 kilo Newton per meter square. Okay. Once you know this value put this value in equation number 1. So, you will get C n equals to C n equals to 0 0.77 log base 10 2000 over 55.14. What you will get here is, so you will get here C n value equals to 1.20. There are upper limits of C n values are also given. So, then you will get n value corrected at 6 meter equals to C n times n field measured values. So, that will be 1.2 times 40 that will give you the value equals to 48. Then apply second correction that is dilatancy correction. So, dilatancy correction you have to apply that will be equals to n c that will be equals to 15 plus half because it is saturated and it is given as uh, sand. So, uh, considering it is a fine sand condition then we will apply 48. So, uh, your corrected um, and uh, this dilatancy correction will be this minus 15. So, that is how you can get how much will be the corrected NSPT for this correction that will come uh, that will come around 31.5 because it is. So, the NSPT is actually the number of blows so you, you have to round off to some um, uh, uh, whole, whole number like 31, you generally round off at lower side because it is the indication of shear strength. So, if you uh, if you round off on, on a higher side, it will be considered as wrong because you will end up in overestimating the strength values. And same way, so same way you can do, same way uh, calculation can be done for calculation for uh, 7.5 meter depth also you can do it. So, here you will get N, uh, N C who are interested you can you, you can actually 
calculate the value of n corrected here that will come around 25.2. So, if you round it off it will come like 25 at 7.5 meter depth. So, that is like though you have measured the value of NSPT as 40 at 6 meter depth, but after overburden correction you found the value as 48 that is it is actually somewhat more and then you apply dilatancy correction which is because of uh, I mean if you if you remove the uh, effect of uh, additional resistance or additional uh, force exerted by the pore water because uh, because of the uh, rate of loading you, you ended up in overestimate in the actual NSPT of the soil at 6 meter depth is actually 31 depending upon that you can actually again classify or get an idea about what will be the relative density of the soil, what will be the angle of internal friction, what is the consistency if it is other kind of soil. So, same way we you can do it for NC of um, 7 point, uh, 7.5 meter depth also. So, this was about cone pen, uh, standard penetration test. Then we have another test called as cone penetration test. As we discussed about standard penetration test earlier, so when we go for standard penetration there are certain uh, though we are uh, uh, collecting the soil sample by dynamic loading, but often uh, 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 it there are always the measured SPT and values are always affected by a number of uh, errors. It may be because of particularly uh, like the hammer efficiency, then second one is manually you are counting the number of blows, so there might be a chance you 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 uh, you miss some number of some particular blow or you will count more number of blows than whatever is actually provided. Third thing, when you are raising your monkey hammer, ideally it should be raised uh, uh, by 76 centimeter. But in case if you raise by some more amount, then the impact load uh, on the sampler will be more, and you will end up in underestimating the shear strength property. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, underestimating the shear strength property because you are giving more impact load than the standard one. So for same soil, if you are giving more impact load, the number of blows will be lesser. So you will end up in underestimating the shear strength and vice versa. If you do not raise up to particular level, then uh, you will end up in, in uh, spending more number of blows for the same uh, soil rather it should be for 76 mm uh, centimeter um, uh, uh, height of loading. So, the, the overall to be summarizing here, it is like the standard penetration test though it is uh, uh, standardized, standardized one, but there are lot of error of I mean there are chances number of ways actually. Uh, there are chances that uh, the SPT and value you are measuring at the site can be affected or like two agencies are doing there might be chances because of these things like number of blows, hammer efficiency, height of fall or somebody has not marked the 15 uh, centimeter uh, uh, interval by means of chalk properly then that will also affect your NSPT measured and uh, uh, values because and, and so on your uh, shear strength of the material. So, finally what you mean to say like though you are conducting the uh, uh, SPT test which is considered a very uh, dynamic test and you can get uh, 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 marginally disturbed sample or maybe at times uh, uh, representative soil sample also, but there are chances that the NSPT value whatever you are measuring it gets affected by number of parameters. So, considering again considering a, sp a split spoon sampler uh, as I discussed earlier, so you have SPT test once you reach a desired depth you push the sampler into the ground and then bring the sample onto the surface split it and then you have the sample with you. If you consider a split spoon sampler as a pile section, so measured NSPT value consists of two parts one is skin friction acting along the surface of the sampler on the side of the sampler and second one is point bearing which is acting at the base of the sampler. But what is happening here you are measuring just one value, so you do not know what, what is the soil resistance in terms of skin friction, what is the soil resistance in terms of end bearing, you are getting a corrective uh, uh, measure here. So, CPT test that is cone penetration test, it helps in determining each of these parameters that is skin friction as well as end bearing separately. This will, uh, this will also uh, provide a very useful information in determining the skin friction and end bearing uh, because you are getting both the parameters separately. One is skin friction you are getting from uh, field in, uh, observation, other one is um, cone resistance or cone tip resistance you are getting from um, uh, basically you are actually uh, doing the test you are measuring two types of measurements at the site. So, one is at the base, another one at the at the periphery of the uh, uh, test setup. So, ASTMD 5778 provides guidelines which can be used for field investigation once you are going for cone penetration test to be conducted at your site of interest. 
The test was developed by Dutch government soil mechanics laboratory at Delft. That is why cone presentation test at times many of the textbook they refer it as Dutch cone test because it was originally developed by uh, uh, soil labor mechanics laboratory at Delft. Uh, okay. So, this test can be done both under static condition where actually you push the penetrometer continuously into the soil and measuring its uh, the resistance offered by the soil in terms of end bearing as well as uh, uh, skin friction and secondly you can do under dynamic loading very much similar to your SPT where you will be applying some kind of impact load just like falling off hammer and then measure the two parameters. So, one is continuous other one is uh, I mean at regular interval you can you can actually measure the uh, soil uh, these things. So, when, when it comes to uh, the, the, the test setup, so the test setup consists of, so the typical set, uh, test setup for performing in situ test consists of uh, three parameters. One is the cone which is actually uh, located at the lower end of the uh, uh, your test assembly which is actually pushing it into the soil and then you have push rods or drill rods which are connected to your uh, uh, cone and transferring the reaction to the cone from the, uh, the assembly which is maybe a hydraulic or, or uh, uh, jacket platform which is actually transferring some kind of reaction to the cone. So, it is transferring getting by means of push rods. Then you are having measuring equipment which is actually measuring how much is the push or uh, uh, resistance you are getting from, from uh, the, the soil layers at different depths and then thrust and reaction chamber with respect to which actually the, the, the cone is getting uh, uh, push force into the soil. So, you are having cone. So, cone can be mechanical or electrically operated. So, mechanically operated uh, I told by means of uh, 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 fall of hammer then you can have electrically operated where you are actually uh, continuously pushing it into the soil. When mechanically operated arrangement is made you can actually push at an increment of 10 to 20 centimeter in one, uh, one time. If electrically operated, you can go for continuous recording, you keep on pushing the uh, 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 the cone into the soil and every time it touches because, because uh, as the cone is getting lowered, it is actually displacing the soil. So, the resistance offered by the soil at the tip and the resistance offered by the soil at the periphery of the cone, both will be recorded. If it is mechanical, the same pushing has to be done in stages to that one stage can be 10 to 20 centimeter push at one time then again another time then so on it keeps on uh, 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 rotating uh, it keeps on adding more and more push unless it reaches the desired depth of uh, 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 interest and the other one is electrically operated. So, it will be continuously lowering it into the soil of interest. So, both can be done. Typically a Dutch cone hammer it consists of so there will be some kind of solid rod on which this cone will be attached this is having in uh, uh, 60 mm uh, this angle and this will be corresponding to 35.6 mm. The solid rod after that there will be some kind of hollow rod will be there. Based on this you will be able to find out what is the friction which is so, so you are pushing it this assembly into the and then this will be connected to the your solid rod or push rod. It will go to the ground surface ground level where actually this assembly will be connected to the uh, uh, reaction chamber you can say or maybe uh, hydraulic push kind of arrangement. So, you, you see here you are having soil layers here, soil layer it can be 1, it can be 2 and so on and then you are having another you, this is called as cone, this is called as sleeve friction. So, because of the soil which is available in this location, you, you may get some kind of resistance here against penetration that will be called as cone tip resistance and then you will be getting another which is offered by the soil again in along the periphery of the this uh, hollow rod and so on and so forth. So, so basically, you, so this is like Dutch cone uh, setup. Uh, which is called as a Dutch cone which is having an apex angle of 60 degree having an, uh, an end area. So, if you take the cross section of this that will be uh, uh, corresponding to 1000 mm. So, that will be 
1000 uh, mm square okay then you have push rod as i told you here so this suppose this is the assembly which is you are actually pushing it into the ground this assembly will be connected suppose this is your ground level so in order to transfer the reaction or force or push from the ground surface you have to have some kind of arrangement which is actually attached to this assembly so these are called as push rod which are actually transferring the reaction you can write it transferring the reaction to the cone cone from reaction chamber reaction chamber or you can call it as reaction frame so basically again this frame considering how much is the cell weight of the frame you can actually provide any kind of push against the against the frame which is actually responsible for pushing this cone into the ground so this is called as push rod there will be some kind of screws here and there will be some kind of screws here so because of which both the cone assembly or penetrometer the center assembly you can call it as penetrometer that will be connected to your push rod and that will help you uh, 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 pushing this rod uh, or this penetrometer at deeper depth so the cone is advanced the same thing is written here the cone is advanced to the desired depth by means of a thick wall so it is because you are depending upon the depth at which you are doing the test the push rod should be strong enough so that it should not get bent or it should not get uh, distorted because of the reaction applied from the surface because it the purpose is to transfer the huge amount of force from the surface to the depth of uh, interest so the push rod should be strong enough typically a push rod is of 1 meter length and many such rods are screwed to each other so there will be screwed on both the ends So depends upon each rod is suppose 1 meter uh, length if you are doing the test for 10 meter you will add up uh, equivalent number of rods how many will be required minimum 10 rods will be required uh, when once you are doing the test at 10 meter depth and so on so uh, you keep on going for deeper depth you keep every time adding more and more rods. but what happens at the at the center because you are actually measuring the resistance so there will be some kind of transducers here some some uh, transducers here is also which are actually some kind of gauges or uh, sensors which are actually uh, measuring the to measure cone resistance cone tip resistance so once it measure it it has to be transferred to the surface and same way here also there will be some kind of friction uh, friction sensors so each of each time you push it into the ground it will record something and then there will be some kind of cables will be there which will be passing through this push rod because it keeping these are hollows so these are called as these are cables which actually transfer the recordings or measurements done by the transducers or, or the sensors at these two locations sometimes you are having pore pressure measurement sensors also here so again that will also impart some additional uh, uh, field measurements because of this cable these phase in measurements will be connected to some kind of assessment here or maybe gauges which will give you how much pressure will be required because this is lowering continuously so continuously there will be measurement of qc value that is cone tip resistance or there will be value of skin friction also qs and qa value and and same way you will be having some value of u not that is pore pressure measurement so at the bottom most push rod the cone mounted on solid rod as i told you this is the cone which is mounted on solid rod and around this there will be hollow rod in between uh, these two uh, you uh, the assembly will be able to measure the how much is the uh, resistance of it along the uh, surface so the lower most rod th that will be connected to the push rod and again there will be because each push rod is hollow so the 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 cable which is transferring the measurement from the sensor to the surface assembly will pass through so it's like beforehand uh, uh, you should have some idea like what is the depth of investigation you have to do because equal and equal number of uh, uh, push rods you have to make ready and before you start the test from those number of rods actually this 
this kinds of cable should pass. So, every time one cable is lowered, you have to attach another cable, make sure that, that, the, that, the, cable, that the push rod uh, should contain the cable inside, otherwise you will not be able to connect the push rod, you will not be able to connect the cable to the assembly. So, because it is a continuous, you cannot do this, such kinds of uh, alteration during the test. And the third one is, which at times used, it is not uh, everywhere, it is not uh, practiced. So, that is frictional uh, uh, reduction rod. The, this rod is put just above the penetrometer. So, the, just above the solid rod, this rod is pu put. The purpose of this rod is to increase the diameter of the borehole larger than the push rod. So, that it will reduce the amount of cumulative friction on the rod because pro provided by the bore, borehole uh, uh, material and thus increase the efficiency of the test even at larger depth. So, if you do not put what happen there will be uh, because friction whatever you are telling you, you may get more number of, of um, I mean uh, large fraction of friction even from the layers which are not surrounded by the uh, uh, penetrometer. There might be some uh, where you can get friction from superficial layer or surficial layers which you are actually not targeting once you reach a particular depth. So, in order to ensure like the penetrometer is only measuring the resistance offered by the soil uh, uh, surrounding this uh, penetrometer, you have to make sure that the soil which are above this penetrometer are, are sufficiently spaced apart from the uh, uh, drill rod or push rod. So, for that you have to actually provide some kind of friction rod, friction reduction rod because you are not, once you provide this kind of rod, you will not be getting additional friction from soil layers which are, which are actually located above the penetrometer in a particular um, uh, role. Okay. So, then uh, uh, field measurement, uh, this measuring equipment, the thrust required to advance the penetrometer is measured at the ground surface. That is what I mentioned earlier also because you are pushing it into the ground. So, every time you push, it will be measuring some kind of cone uh, tip resistance, it will be measuring the uh, uh, skin friction also. Once it records, because it is continuously pushing, the so same thing you, you will be recording at the surface. This is called as the thrust required to advance the penetrometer will be measured at the ground surface. For mechanical penetrometer, a hydraulic or electrical load cell is used that can directly, you can quantify how much is the load you have applied. For electrical penetrometer, transducers attached to the cone tip and uh, friction sleeves are used. These transducers are connected to the surface recording assembly by means of connecting cables. So, so whatever cables I was discussing, those are called as connecting cables passing through the push rod because push rods are hollow. So, through those push rods, it, it can actually connect your me measuring as uh, assembly to the penetrometer which is kept at the surface. Then thrust reaction or uh, because finally you are pushing it, so you have to have some mechanism based on which you can apply some kind of reaction. You can build up the reaction or the force which is responsible for pushing this cone to different depths. So, a thrust system is required, what we will do? So, you will have some kind of uh, um, uh, generally like truck mounted reaction chambers will be there. So, your entire assembly for uh, uh, whether it is pu um, uh, push rod, whether it is penetrometer, whether it is uh, friction reduction rod, where connecting cables, where uh, gauges for measuring different kind of friction uh, uh, resistance, everything will be kept in a, uh, in a chamber and that chamber will be mounted on a mo mobile truck. The truck should be uh, heavy enough so that whatever reactions are getting because you have to um, uh, you have to push the cone into the deeper depth. So, uh, again, unless the, uh, the reaction chamber or the truck is heavy enough, what will happen as you start pushing at deeper depth, it will actually the, the, the uh, resistance offered by the, by the soil if it is more than the, uh, uh, the, the reaction chamber capacity, it will lift the uh, 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 truck itself. So, a thrust uh, system is required to advance the push rod and penetrometer into the ground to the desired depth. So, you have to again just like uh, I told like depending upon the depth you are uh, targeting for, you have to arrange so many push rods and from each of those push rods you have to pass the connecting cable. Same way if you if you are targeting for deeper depths, your reaction chamber or the thrust chamber which is actually providing the, re the force which is driving the cone into, into to that particular depth, you have to take into account wh what is the capacity or what should be the capacity of the reaction chamber. The reaction chamber should be capable of advancing the penetrometer at constant rate 
the magnitude of the thrust however may vary. Hydraulic push systems having a capacity of 9 to 18 tons. Now you consider 9 to 18 tons itself is required when you are targeting to measure the SPTN value for uh, to measure CPT value maybe in the range of 15, 20 meter like that. So now you understand what you, uh, you, you, you should understand like as you go deeper and deeper there will be lot of confinement and in order to measure the resistance by this particular method there should be some kind of uh, 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 failure happen in the soil otherwise it will not give you the resistance offered by the soil. So in order to make that kind of failure to occur you have to apply sufficient amount of thrust or reaction. So this is like 19 to 20 is uh, fair enough to give you idea like what is the uh, magnitude of the reaction we, we are looking for. Such system should be mounted on stable platform because otherwise if the platform is not stable you go deeper you, you start applying reaction by chance if it gets uh, tilted then either it may break the, the uh, push rod or whatever value you are getting it will not be correct. So it is mandatory like even though you are mounted on the truck the truck once you set up at the uh, once you position at the uh, site of interest there will be some kind of uh, 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 lifting arrangement which will actually lift the entire uh, 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 truck or reaction chamber and provide it more stability against later movement. You, you can check also uh, uh, so uh, example is given like heavy duty truck you can use it. So once you go, go to the site, once you center it at your uh, specific location where you have to do the test, you can actually provide those uh, steady platforms or legs, lift the truck, entire, entire truck so it will, it will not go any kind of little movement. Then you start applying reaction against the load of the truck itself and whatever resistance offered, it will be measured by the gauges available at the. So it is like okay, you went to the site, you, you, you centered your uh, equipment, you started lowering then what, what uh, uh, field recordings you have to do. So first one is continuous recording, so let us discuss about field measurements. Continuous lowering of cone measures variation of three parameters as I told here, it keeps on recording at, an in, at every interval of 5 centimeters. So you will have some recording then after 5 centimeter another set of data will be there another 5 centimeter another set of data and so on till the depth you, you go for uh, 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 till the depth of your interest. So once it reaches any depth it measures cone tip resistance the resistance offered by uh, offered against the push by the soil available at the tip of the cone by means of transducers in terms of cone tip resistance second one is sleeve friction or the resistance offered by the soil which is available all around the penetrometer and third one is in case uh, it is saturated condition you may get poor water pressure also by means of strain gauges. So cone tip resistance that is generally indicated by QC measured as the ratio of the force or resistance at the tip by means of load cell determined behind the cone to the normalized projected area because finally this particular load whatever you are you are applying from the top and which is which is causing the failure at the uh, base of the cone it is like the load will be there and then the projected area so the load divided by the area that will give you the tip resistance so that is uh, some kind of uh, stress then you have additional uh, stress that is called as sleeve friction known no, called as fs defined as the ratio of force on the sleeve or on the vertical edges of the penetrometer measured by means of tension load cell in the sleeve itself between the hollow rod and between the solid rod to the area of the sleeve to the surface area of the sleeve. So you, so, so you have one, one resistance at the base it is like the force at the base causing the failure divided by the area of that uh, the projected area then another one is the uh, failure happening along the sides. So you have to have how much is the force taken by the surrounding soil divided by the peripheral area or th this is called as the you can call it as the surface area of the surface area of the sleeve that will give you uh, this thing. And the third one is pore pressure measurement that you generally do by means of pore pressure sensors directly. So you need not have any, any area to be used here. Okay. So then you can determine one parameter which is called as frictional ratio 
Friction ratio is defined as the ratio of sleeve friction that is uh, Fs and then cone tip resistance that is Qc. So, you can call it Fr equals to Fs over Qc. So, you went to the site, measure this parameter based on your uh, uh, gauge readings and then determine this parameter. This parameter will be required because now you uh, see your, your target was to determine to identify the soil to find its in, in situ strength and other properties so that you will understand you will have better understanding about what kind of soil is available whether the soil is sufficient enough for the kind of load I am targeting for. So, for each this now it is like now you, once your field measurements are done you are going for interpretation of your field records of field records from SPT from your CPT test. Okay. So, typical field records you can see like as you go at the site of interest you will be having different soil layers. I can say soil layer 1, soil layer 2, soil layer 3, soil layer 4, soil layer 5, soil layer 6, soil layer 7. And I am considering here also within this, this is like 5 centimeter, 5 centimeter and so on other thickness and this is your ground level. You started pushing your penetrometer here, there will be this hollow rod and solid rod which is and then this is connected to your reaction chamber which is actually pushing it with, ref, uh, with reference to this, you are actually pushing it into the ground. Every time it reaches, it will measure your QC value, it will measure your FS values. So, if you see here with respect to the depth, because it is giving you continuous recordings, you will have with respect to the depth, maybe measured in meters, you will have some value of QC depending upon the unit, depending upon the uh, uh, soil type or resistance offered by the soil. So, you will have some value like this kind of this. So, this is like the value you will get from your uh, field recording itself. Then at the parallel you will have some values of Fs, maybe also in Kpa or maybe Mpa also and then here also it is depth. This is like typical field record I am trying to show you here and then there also you can have some values like this depending upon how much is the resistance offered along the periphery. Then third one may be U naught value or pore water pressure again with respect to the depth. How much is the pore water pressure? Again that depends upon how much is the what is the level of ground water table. You may have similar value or you may have some incremental value or, or so on and so forth. So, these are the three things and then you have Fr which is known as Fs over Qc. You determine those values. So, this is Fr value with respect to depth depending upon the Fs value or Fr value this also you will get it. So, I have connected but each of these will be having values measured at 5 5 centimeter interval. So, though I have joined each of these points by continuous line but you will not have I mean you will have recording at each 5 centimeter interval. So, this is this line is composed of joining the points at 5 5 centimeter interval, these curves and so on and so forth for this also. But you remember in mind like you are doing the test at the site of interest from the ground surface also. So, this test is not going to give you any kind of so far you have not, uh, you are not aware about any sample you are going to get or not. But this is the information you get once you, you lower your penetrometer and these are the um, different kind of measurements you can actually do at the site. So, based on this you have to actually interpret different parameters. This is a typical field record, then you start interpretation. Before going to the interpretation we will discuss about advantage because when you go for SPT test particularly, so you do generally the test at regular interval maybe 1 meter, 1.5 meter, 2 meter 
standard is 1.5 meter, but again depending upon the, the designer's recommendation, you can go for uh, uh, lower rate of sampling or maybe higher rate of sampling. So, if some soil layer, very small layer is there, you will, uh, you will end up in uh, uh, neglecting that soil layer or that, uh, that will not be reflected in uh, SPT thing. But here you can get continuous or near continuous record of soil sample uh, in, term, I mean, in terms of QC and FS value. Then data are in in situ condition because you are not collecting the sample and bring it onto the surface. So, whatever resistance the soil is offering, whether it is end bearing or friction, it is in its in situ condition, very much similar to your Bain shear test. Hence, better suited. So, whatever property you are determining, you can directly use it for geotechnical design problems or solution to geotechnical problems quick because you are not. Uh, uh, unlike your SPD test where you collect the sample, you bring it onto the surface, then lower your boring assembly, then reach to the uh, next depth of interpretation, you again collect the sample. Here you are not do, uh, replacing the boring and sampling uh, uh, assemblies, but you are doing actually continuous recording. So, it is quick, it is economical and most uh, another thing is like chances of uh, 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 it, uh, the chances of error also it will be very less because not nowhere uh, uh, you are doing it anything manually. However, there are there will not be always advantage, there are certain disadvantage also. So, it does not retrieve any soil sample during testing as I told here because there are transducers which are going to give you how much is the resistance offered by different soil layer at different depths uh, in terms of different parameters, but finally it is not going to give you any soil sample which is particularly uh, you, you used to get in your SPG test. However, if you require a soil sample, you can replace your cone tip by a soil sampler. It requires time to transfer and interpret the data directly whatever data you are uh, getting. You cannot use it to, to, to identify the soil, you have to actually interpret the data and interpret you have to uh, also refer to um, um, uh, standard curves also, charts also in order to um, uh, come up at different soil properties. So, require interpretation for require transfer of data as well as interpretation has limited depth capacity because uh, finally you are measuring the soil resistance. So, you uh, you can have you can go maybe in the range of uh, maybe 25 30 meter or maybe in, in exceptional cases uh, uh, higher depths also, but in comparison to other tests it has limited capacity in terms of depth particularly in case of very dense sand and cementitious uh, cemented uh, strata or glacial uh, tills. Obstructions such as boulders which in if in case comes in SPD test provided the size of the boulder is smaller than the size of the sampler, you can go for uh, SPD test recording, but here you cannot do it because it is actually measuring the it is measuring the resistance of at the base. So, if boulder is there actually it is it will not be able to uh, pass through it. So, you have to terminate the uh, ter terminate the test at that particular location either you remove the uh, um, I mean boulder or maybe uh, you can go for other uh, test locations. So, these are the certain disadvantages. Okay. So, you had some values of um, slip friction as well as cone tip resistance based on which you can determine the value of FR. If you apply the correction also with respect to uh, overburden, you can get the corrected FR value if suggested or if you are referring to uh, the, the curve pro, uh, proposed for corrected values. Similarly, you, you can so, so based once you have the corrected or uh, you, you have the value of friction ratio and you have the value of cone tip resistance, you can get an idea even without collecting the soil sample whether your soil is gravel, whether your soil is sand, whether your soil is sand mixed with silt, sand and clay, whether it is silt mixture, whether it is sensitivity increasing you can see here in case of clays if it is going in this direction, there is increase in sensitivity and so on. So, there is a broader classification given as per Olson in 1988 chart based on uh, your uh, F, FS, uh, FR value as well as based on your QC value. Same way Robinson in 1990 also proposed, if you know the value of friction ratio, normalized friction ratio and cone tip resistance, this way also you can get an idea about sensitivity and uh, whatever um, uh, uh, properties you can, you can determine for, for in situ site. Same way you can actually determine so many parameters, one is undrained shear strength properties, drained angle of internal friction, then over consolidation ratio, equivalent uh, uh, 
uh, standard penetration test corrected for 60 percent hammer energy, then coefficient of little earth pressure you can determine, then total density, relative density, word ratio you can determine, constant modulus. So, you, many of those parameters you can determine simply by measuring two parameters, one is skin friction, one is um, cone tip resistance. Caution, one, one important thing which has to be highlighted here is because once you are pushing the, uh, the, the, the cone into the uh, soil, it is supposed to cause some kind of failure, but issue here is though it is ca causing the failure, it is not causing the failure at the tip, this is cone tip. So, in order to push it into the ground, it has to uh, cause passive failure. But it has been observed this passive failure is not happening at the soil which is available next to the cone tip, but at a soil which is available at soil available at 21 centimeter ahead. So, whatever resistance you are measuring in terms of cone tip resistance, it is actually indication of resistance offered by the soil 21 centimeter ahead. That is what it is written here. So, CPT causes passively in the soil while advancing as a result of which the soil senses the resistance of soil, the sensors uh, senses the uh, resistance of the soil available at 21 centimeter ahead. So, it is not going to give you the resistance offered by the soil at cone tip, but at 21 centimeter ahead of cone tip. Second thing in case of partially saturated cohesionless soil, uh, partially saturated cohesive soils, Additional friction will be recorded because it is partially saturated which can lead to erroneous uh, results. Third one, third and uh, more important here is when passes through dry clays, now dry clays uh, uh, it will offer, it can offer resistance in terms of friction, but as we know I mean because it is clay it is not supposed to. So, at times even though it gives you lower value of friction which is the characteristic of sandy soil. So, when passes through dry clay deposit, it may give you lower value of friction ratio. So, low, low friction ratio can, can be, uh, you can get either in terms of dry clay or you can get in terms of sandy soil. So, once you are getting it, you have to be more careful whether the soil interpretation is correct or not. Okay. This is another uh, graph given by Leun in uh, 1997, uh, among many popular graphs. So, once you know the cone the tip resistance, once you know the friction ratio, you can actually classify which kind of soil you are targeting or which kind of soil you have encountered at the depth of interest. Now, here you are not getting any, uh, you are neither getting normalized value as were there in uh, previous graphs, now you are getting corrected values. So, you can directly use this chart to find out the values uh, uh, obtained from the field recording. So, in order to discuss this, we, uh, I have brought one um, uh, numerical problem you can see here. Given data is obtained from field uh, during CPT investigation, indicate what kind of soil is available at different different depth and also plot the CPT data including FR variation with respect to depth. So, FR is actually uh, friction ratio. So, with respect to depth, you have been given the value of QC and you have been given the value of QS or FS and you have to determine the value. So, in order to identify the soil type as highlighted in the previous uh, um, graph here, once you know the value of QC, once you know the value of FR, you can directly use this graph by Leon et al 1997 and classify whether what kind of soil is available if this kind of data is given to you. So, to start with you can actually determine what will be the value of, so this is like you can start here with depth in meter then the value of QC given in MPA, then QC value you can convert it into KPA because other value of FS is also given in KPA. So, FS, KPA, then based on this you can determine the value of friction ratio and then you can determine the soil type. So, when you are referring to soil type, you can also very precisely mention here as per Leon et al 1997. So, as if you go here, you have data given at 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, 5.5, 6.5, 8.5, 9.5, 10.5, 11.5, 
9.5 meter and how much is the value of QC given here 1.8 then 0 0.40 then 0 6.90 9.20 8.45 and 9.50 I think uh, there is some uh, overlap between the values so this is corresponding to this this is corresponding to this and so on then you convert it so you will get one value 1860 1160 2280 290 380 400 6900 9200 8450 9500 this is the value of QC you will be getting here then the value of FS is given as 22.02 then 28.72 then 24.89 then 12.44, then 15.32, then 14.74, then 28.72, then 26. Point, okay. So it was 26.72 and so on. So to start with the problem, let us uh, first of all write what are the values given here. So you can get write here a depth given in meter then the values of QC given in, I am going to write the values directly in KPA because the value of FS is, is also given in KPA. So, you can write here FS, KPA which I have given here also QF, then the values of, we, we are trying to find out how much will the value of FR and then based on the value of FR, what will be the soil type. So, when you are uh, defining the soil type, it will be better if you can write using which methodology based on which paper you are referring to, to convert this uh, field recording or FR or uh, QC value based um, uh, uh, interpretation about the soil type. So, this is soil and this 0.5, 1.5, 2.5. So, this is these are the values given in the numerical problem 5.5, 6.5, 7.5, 8.5, 9.5, 10.5, 11.5, 12.5, 13.5, 5.5, and so on. I mean, it is given up to 9.5. Let us see the how much is the value of QC given 1860, 1160, then 22, 22280, then uh, 290, then uh, 380, 400, 6900, 9200, then 8450, then 9500. These are the values given uh, in terms of KPI I have converted. So, do not get confused. Original values are given in MPA, I have converted into kilopascals. Then the value of QS or FS is given as 22.02, 28.72, then uh, 12.44, 15.32, 14.74, 28.72, 26.81, 43.09, 34.60. These are the values given, then you determine the value of FR equals to FS over QC. Both are given in same unit. I am using here it in KPA. So, how much is the value of FS you will get? It will be 1.19, 2.48, 1.03, 1.04, 1.05, 1.06, 1.07, 1.08, 1.09, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 
and this is the value of QC. Read what will be the soil type from this. So, for your understanding, I have just classified the soil type here. I am writing here directly. You can check with the graph given by Loon et al. So, it is like silt mixture, then you have clay, you have clay here, this is you are having sand, then you are having clay, 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 then you are having sand in other depth, sand and then sand. So, you can see here even without collecting any soil sample just by measuring the cone tip resistance as well as killing friction you determine the value of FR make sure the value of both the resistance or uh, are in the same unit you will be able to determine the values of FR and based on this uh, unit all paper you can directly classify what kind of soil is there. So, this is one part of the question where you have to identify what kind of soil is available at different depth and then putting these values of FR versus QC. So, this is depth then QC value then depth versus FS value and depth versus FR value you can actually you can actually draw, draw using maybe uh, uh, maybe even excel sheet you can use this value you can actually draw it so that will complete your second part of the work whatever is asked here so this is all um, um, uh, about uh, uh, cone penetration test so today we discuss about how how we interpret the data how we apply correction when you are going for standard penetration test data similarly if you are doing if you are uh, doing cone penetration test though we are not able, we are not uh, retrieving any kind of soil sample, but still based on the field recordings in terms of uh, uh, typical 2 or 3 measurements we, we can identify the soil type and uh, 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 using the different correlation given by different people you can also determine the value of different parameter like over consolidation ratio, uh, coefficient of earth pressure at rest, undrained shear strength and so on and so forth. So, this is about the today's class. Thank you so much.